الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله ارسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وان كل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد ان اقول اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الناس قد جاءتكم موعظه من ربكم وشفاء لما في الصدور وهدى ورحمه للمؤمنين قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا هو خير مما يشاءون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين رب العالمين. Today is the second installment of a series of khutbahs I intend to give on the source of happiness. Where does happiness come from? Uh, last week I introduced the topic by discussing some things about ayah number 58 of Surah Yunus. We're going to work our way backwards and look at some things from Surah number, the same Surah but ayah number 57, where Allah Azza wa Jalla actually describes the components that one needs in their life to get to a place where they're actually genuinely happy. Bear in mind that the Quran gave a different definition for things that we use conventionally. So for example, success, right? So we have in life, doesn't matter what culture you and I come from, even doesn't matter for most people or religion they come from, they have similar ideas of what success means. A good career is success, a good education is success, a good Financial situation is a success. Health is success. These are things that we associate with success. Similarly, uh, we have similar definitions of happiness, similar definitions of enjoyment. The nature is similar, right? So it's not just because we, we belong to the religion of Islam and somebody else is a Hindu or somebody else is a Christian or somebody else is an atheist doesn't mean that their ideas or their emotions towards happiness, towards success, towards sadness, towards triumph and difficulty are different. In fact, Allah said, we were all created in the same kind of struggle. Right? So we had the same trials that fall on you and me are the same kind of trials that fall on anybody else. Doesn't matter what their religion is, right? But what, what does the Quran do in addition? So we have this common human experience. But what Allah does is He offers us a, an additional insight, additional wisdom that could only come from Him about some of these things that we take for granted, like for example, success. You and I have a definition like every other human being of success, but Allah adds something to that definition that only a believer has. So now everybody else can see success the same way, and maybe a percent of that is true for us too, but there's something else that's been added that redefines it for us. Same thing with loss. Same thing with, in fact, happiness. And that's actually one of the things we're trying to accomplish in this attempt at contemplating Ayahs number 57 and 58 of Surah Yunus is that Allah is in fact talking about happiness. Because of that, they should be filled with joy. They should be over, overly happy. They, sh they should be overjoyed. So Allah is talking about happiness. But he's talking about it from a point of view that only at the end of the day, there's a dimension of it that only a believer can truly understand and experience. So what that does then for us is something really interesting. There's a, there's a kind of happiness that human, other human beings can't even imagine. Like it doesn't exist for them. It only exists for us. There are other kinds of happiness. They can go to Six Flags and go on a ride and feel happy. We can do that too. Right? There, there are elements of happiness that we have in common with everybody else. But there is a dimension of happiness that is unlocked in the Quran that if you if you meet these pieces, if you if you have these pieces of the puzzle in your life, that you'll experience a kind of divine happiness that is not accessible to other human beings. And that's what we're trying to get to, that real, true, missing component of happiness. Because at the end of the day, it's easy to say, well, I know a lot of non-Muslims, they seem happy too. They're happy. And that's true. They can be happy. They can be. But there's a side of it that they don't even know exists. 
And that's the side that we're trying to unlock. Okay? And in fact, this one side of it affects all the other dimensions of happiness too. It affects all of them. So here's where we want to begin. So at Yunus, long surah, and I said this is towards the end of, you know, towards the, really the thick of the surah. The beginning of it, there are two major debates that are happening that the Quran has revealed. The Prophet is actually engaged also in a very intense back and forth with people who don't believe in it. And there are two major subjects. One, whether or not the Quran is made up by a human being or is it from Allah or not. Okay, so is it Muftan? Is it made up? Or is it, is it, is it, is it the, the word of Muhammad وسلم, or is it actually revelation? And why is this such a hard thing to accept? Because one of the claims in the Quran is very difficult for them to accept. And that is the claim of judgment that is coming. The claim of the afterlife that is coming. There's a life that's coming after this death. This is one of the big reasons for them to think that this, these words that are coming are just a fantasy. They're just this crazy story. There's no reason to believe it. And the debate about that, why should you believe this is the word of Allah? And why should you believe that there's an afterlife that's definitely on its way? That's the conversation that's been happening in Surah Yunus up until now. So we're talking about ayah number 57. This is what's been happening from the beginning all the way to 56. Okay. Now, that's important to know because now we're talk this conversation is happening with those who are aggressive against the Quran. They already have an opinion towards the Quran that it's nonsense to them. It doesn't make any sense. To them. It's a lie to them. It's a propaganda to them. It's the enemy's word to them. So there's an ideological conflict that's being talked about. And then Allah takes a pause from that conflict and turns to the rest of society. So this is really important because, you know, the loudest people in the world, they can get on media and get into debates, right? And the majority of the people are silently watching. They're just silently watching a debate. And the majority of the people are not this way or that way. They're just watching the show. They're just the silent majority, right? So just because some guy who speaks out against Islam or somebody who is debating has millions of views on his video doesn't mean that all the people who watch the video are on his side. They're just spectators. So what does Allah do? Allah acknowledges that there's a debate going on, but the debate is not happening with everybody. It's happening with the Prophet a handful of believers and a handful of very aggressive mushrikeen. But then there's the rest of Makkah. There's everybody else. They're just the silent majority. What about them? So what Allah does now is he takes a pause from that debate and he turns to the entire majority and says, essentially says, you don't have to have a preconceived bias towards what the Quran is or isn't. You should approach this invitation, this word of Allah, from scratch with no previous preconceived notions. And so the ayat begin, Ya ayyuhan nas, humanity, people, people. This is not the mushrikeen, not Ya ayyuhan kafirun, Ya ayyuhan mushrikun, Ya ayyuhan ladina kafaru. None of those things. It's Ya ayyuhan nas, people. So it's an open invite to everybody else. And in those words, what's embedded is you and I are supposed to undo the debates we've heard. And so what does that mean for us right now in 2021 as we're listening to this? What that means is Muslims and non-Muslims alike we have certain assumptions about what the Qur'an has to say. What the Qur'an means for me in my life. What its role is. And sometimes misinformation about that comes from non-Muslims. And other times misinformation comes about that from Muslims. Muslims are also often misinformed about what the Qur'an really says or what it's supposed to be. What role is it supposed to play in my life? Now what Allah does is believer, non-believer, all humanity are put in one address, Ya Ayyuhan Nas, and we're basically being told, start from scratch, start over, re renew your connection with the Qur'an, and here's how you define it for yourselves. And if you define it in this way, this might have something to do with what I, what the real subject is, happiness itself, joy itself. So what does he say? He says, That a council, a powerful council, certainly has come to you from your master. Now this statement, we're going to try to unpack it a little bit and, 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 and learn some things from this first portion of ayah number 57 today. I've given khutbah about this ayah before, so I'll, I'll you know, uh, remind you of some things about the word mawa'idha that's being used. It comes from the word wa'ad in Arabic, or wa'adha, wa'ain and va. And this is actually, um, 
كلام او عمل ينبه به الانسان الى عواقب ما يفعله او ما هو مقدم عليه ليتوقف عنه. So this is any speech or any action, any gesture that brings a human being's attention to the consequences of what they're about to do. No ridha, I translate it as counsel. So I'm, we're getting more technical now. So what no ridha means in the Arabic languages, when you tell somebody something or you show somebody something by actions, that is making them realize that what I'm about to do is going to have certain bad consequences. So I should stop from what I'm just about to do. So you are about to do something stupid. You're about to do something that was going to hurt yourself. You're about to say something that wasn't going to be good. You were going to land yourself in trouble. And Mawr'idha, the purpose of Mawr'idha is somebody said a word to you, or you saw something, you saw someone act in a certain way, and you realized about yourself, man, I need to, maybe I need to rethink what I was about to do, right? And then if, if you took that from the speech or somebody else's action, then you have taken Mawr'idha. So, it's essentially the kind of speech where you're not just telling someone do this and don't do this, you're trying to help somebody understand if you do this, then here are the bad consequences that might come to you. Or if you do this good thing instead, here are the good things that might come your way, right? So, you know, often we, when we want somebody to do something or not do something, we just say, do this, don't do this, like with kids. You know, do this, no, do and the most annoying kid, question kids ask is, but why? Why can't I do it? Why can't I, you know, the why question. But why is at the heart of being human. Like, you can't do, you can't really stop yourself from doing something if you don't understand why should I stop. You're really not going to commit yourself to do something until you really understand why should I do this. And a lot of what we do in life is hard. It's hard work. And a lot of things we should stop from like bad food, tastes really good, right? It, it just tastes really good. And so when someone says, stop eating junk, you say, why? It tastes so good. Why? Then somebody needs mawariba, right? Or they need to see somebody who's in the hospital because they eat the same kind of food for several years. So they're like, oh, okay, okay, that's why. Okay, now I kind of get it, right? So they're taking mawariba from somebody's speech or somebody's action. Now that's a little bit about the word. But the actual word in Arabic is al-wa'af. Al-wa'af or al -wa these are the words that are used in the Arabic language. But Allah chose instead to use the word mawa'idha, with a meme in the beginning. This is not a soft class, or, but, but I will tell you that this form of the word is used, this, this is meme, this, this Muslim meme it's called, it's done to take a word and make it feel a lot heavier. So if this was being translated as the word counsel or advice, or a sense of consequences, and it would have to be all capital and bold, and the font size might have to be a little bit bigger, because no is with the meme in the beginning and a tamma at the end, it's mubarak, right? So it's very serious, great, powerful counsel has come to you. And what happens on top of that is, this is called a masla, an infinitive, and the infinitives in the Arabic language should typically come with al in the beginning. So qad ja'atkum al mawridatu, al mawridatu. But Allah did not reveal the al here. There's no al, it's, it's munawan, it's mawridatun. What that, that the mean is unexpected. And what that does for English audiences is it makes it grand. So it's grand for several reasons. It's as if Allah is saying, if I was trying to translate that in English, counsel, do you understand? Counsel, advice has come to you from your master. Like it's not a small word. It's not being said in a small way. And then appreciate the other side of this. The word ja'a, which means to come. You might be familiar with the word, right? Well, counsel, the, the idea of the, the verb to come or to arrive is actually a, a, a metaphor. It's a figure of speech. It's not literal. Because advice doesn't come to you. A person comes to you, right? An advisor comes to you, right? And it's actually a metaphor for badaha, to reach. Like, you know how they say the news has reached me? The news reached me? So, well, first let's understand the difference between advice has reached me and advice has come to me. Let's understand the difference between those. You know what can reach you? The air can reach you. A sound can reach you. Two people are arguing down the street and you're walking by, you're walking by and their argument reached your ear. Which means it wasn't meant for you, but it still reached you anyway. You understand? News can spread, 
the intention wasn't that the news was meant for you, but it reached you anyway. You overheard. So reaching can happen by accident. But when something comes to you, when something comes to you, you know what that implies? It was directly meant for you. It was specific for you. So not only is this council remarkable, it's grand, it's a huge deal, but it specifically came for you. It came to all of you. Then there's the other side of it, which is Ata versus Ja. Ata also means to come. So if you if we write in the ayah, as opposed to which is what Allah revealed. Ata is used if I just came home at Taytul Bayt. I came home. But if I came from a long distance and it was a really difficult journey, then Jitul Bayt in classical Arabic. It's actually, a, it, it involves mashakka, it's hard work. It's not an easy thing. What Allah is indicating there is not only is this very powerful advice, not only is this specific to me, but it came from a long distance. It came from the heavens all the way to, to you specifically, a special package for you. You know how people get excited when they see an Amazon package at their door? Mm -hmm. Then they say, oh, it's for dad. Oh. Like they, they, they want to see their name, like, ah. Did, did mine come? Did mine come? Like a package just for you, <laughs> you know? And then the, the, the more you had to wait for something, because it came from a longer distance, it's being shipped from China or somewhere, and it came with lots of stickers on it. Now you're more excited because it came from a longer distance. What Allah has done for humanity here is, people, all of you listen up. Some, a really beautiful, bit, powerful bit of advice, grand advice, has come all the way just for you. Okay, fine. That's, you know, we, we got this far. But then there's the other component to this, which is counsel itself. I told you the technical definition is when you make somebody aware of the consequences of what they can do, right? That's not always a comfortable thing to hear. Like if your friend told you, bro, come on, stop doing that. Then you don't want to be their friend anymore. <laughs> like, um, excuse me, I thought we were friends. Why are you talking to me like this? Why are you always correcting me? Why are you pointing that out? And if family tries to correct you, can you stop? You starting again? It's not Juma. You don't have to give me a khutbah right now. Like you, <laughs> you can get annoyed because somebody's giving you counsel. We don't like getting counsel. We don't like because when somebody's giving you counsel, what's implicit inside? It? What's the kinaya in? It? The implicit, the idea is, I'm heading in the wrong direction. I'm about to do something wrong, or I'm engaged in something wrong. I'm saying something wrong. Right? And my behavior has something wrong with it. And somebody's pointing that out. Now, our defense mechanism is when somebody points out that we're doing something wrong, or we could be doing something better, then they are attacking us. And, you know, self-respect, ego, pride, you name it, whatever you want to, who are you to tell me? Have you seen yourself? You, you want to give me more? Let me give you more. You can flip it around and because you're deflecting. Or you can deflect not only back to the person who's trying to give you advice, you can deflect to somebody else. You seriously, you're going to tell me what to do? Don't you know there are mass murderers out there that do a lot worse? You can't advise them. I'm the only one left in the universe you left to advise. Right? So we're, we're averse. We're allergic to being advised. It doesn't feel good. It, doesn't, it feels like being attacked. It feels like being attacked. What's interesting about the word mo'ida is that the word in it contains ma'yablughul qalb. What reaches into the heart. What, so it's an advice. It's advice about something that needs to get corrected, something that could be better. But it's said in a way that instead of making you make your guard go up and become, you know, uh, uh, become offended, it comes in a way that actually hits your heart. Now, how can that happen? How can that possibly happen? The only way that can happen, because naturally we are allergic to advice, is the last portion of this description. Moor Ibas has a description in the ayah. And that is from your master, from your nurturing master. Allah has the idea of nurturing in it, Ububiya has nurturing in it, meaning someone who wants to see you. Your Rabb is not just someone who owns you. Your Rabb isn't just someone who has authority over you and you're their slave. Your Rabb, Allah, is someone who wants to see you grow, actually wants to see you mature, wants to see you receive more and more gifts. So whenever he gives you some counsel, it's actually for your own benefit. This is a relationship of very serious trust when you're able to take advice and not be offended by it. Let me give you a scenario. There are athletes that are training for you know, whatever sport, right? And they have coaches. 
athletes have coaches. So a coach can be pretty hard on the athlete. He can say, hey, your posture is no good, or you're doing this wrong, and they can be pretty tough on them. And the, the athlete, if they, if they realize that this is a world-class coach, and I'm very lucky to get coached by this trainer, then even when they're giving the toughest advice and being the most critical, they are even more grateful that I'm lucky enough to be corrected and be counseled by this trainer because he wants me to win the Olympics. He wants me to surpass all expectations. He will take me further than I can take myself. So a real genuine athlete that wants to excel is actually going to surrender his ego to his coach or her coach. And the coach can discipline them, make them do extra laps, make them quit certain kinds of food, make them do whatever kind of exercise, make them repeat things. And you know what? Even when they're annoyed, they will do it because they know this. they see my success as their own success. They're invested in me. And so I'm not offended by the advice that they're giving, right? Why does that happen? Because the athlete handed certain level of authority to the coach. That's the only scenario in which that can happen. Now, what happens in school? In school, a lot of you guys, especially in the American public school system, or even in the university system, you have professors, you have teachers, that so many students have genuinely no respect for them, none at all. So when that teacher gives you advice, you're like, whatever. Like, it's not like he cares about me or my success. He's just doing his job. And you have this perception that this teacher is not invested in me. So why should their advice matter to me? The only time you take somebody's advice seriously, even especially critical advice seriously, is when you see how much they're pouring into you, how much they're investing into you. And that's the only time you can take their advice to heart. Otherwise, it's just going to bounce right off and there's just annoying words, right? And so what Allah has done here is given us an invitation by even the use of the word Allah. First, realize what, I, what has Allah been doing for me my entire life? What has he been doing for me? How has he been taking care of me? How has he kept me healthy when I know there are so many sicknesses in the world? How has he provided for me when there's so much bankruptcy and poverty in the world? You know, how, how many opportunities has he given me that people smarter than me never even imagined those kinds of opportunities that he gave to me? So he's been taking care of me, and now he's giving me advice, and somehow my immaturity makes me think that his advice is annoying, or his advice is a burden, or his advice is, come on, man, let me live. No, his advice is the best possible thing for it. You're lucky enough to get his advice. You're lucky enough to get his counsel. So before I, I, I conclude this khutbah, this khutbah was supposed to be about happiness, if you remember. That's the, the conversation we're leading to. This, and it seems like we're on a completely different topic. How are we going to end up in happiness? One of the missing components of happiness in a person's life that modern psychology might not be able to tell you is that you, you need someone in your life that is invested in you and can give you tough advice, real advice, even advice that doesn't feel good when you hear it. Even advice that exposes my flaws for what they are. They expose them for what they are. And you can recognize that even when that criticism is coming, it's coming from a place of love. Now compare this to human beings for a moment. Okay, our, the, the, the people that love us the most in the world, for example, an easy example of that is our mothers, our fathers, our parents. But parents at the end of the day are also human beings. You know what can happen to parents? Parents can get in the habit of only criticizing. They find everything wrong with you. You sit the wrong way, you stand up the wrong way, you smile the wrong way, you dress the wrong way. You're, you know, everything is wrong about you. Everything's just, there's some constant criticism. And what happens to a child, a daughter, a son, that's constantly being criticized, 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 they become numb, right? It's like mom doesn't even see anything good in me. It's like dad, all he sees is I'm a walking problem. I'm just a walking disappointment. That's all I am, right? Once in maybe three eights, he might tell me he's proud of me. Or once in 30 years, I might hear those words. Otherwise, I, I hear nothing good from him. I only hear criticism from him. All he's got is advice about what I should be doing, what I should be doing, what I should be doing, how I could have done this better, could have done that better, regret, 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 negative, 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 right? Well, you know what? If someone's always giving you advice, then the relationship becomes blurred because there's no encouragement. There's no affirmation. Allah is not this way. When Allah is giving counsel, he's encouraging, he's filling you with hope. He's also scaring you of consequences. He's also rewarding you. It's, it's, it's not a one-way relationship. It's not a one kind of relationship. Human beings can become like that sometimes. But Allah doesn't become like that. 
And finally, what I want to include in this khutbah is a disclaimer. Uh, that was going to be a khutbah by itself, but I want to include it here, inshallah, so you, your thoughts are, 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 are deeper about the subject as we try to get towards the place where we can genuinely live a happy life. So what, what one component of a happy life is what? If we don't have genuine counsel coming our way, and we think that we don't need any advice, I don't need anybody's help. But the fact that more Iqbal was given to all of us, you know what that means? All of us are in need of more Iqbal. Right? So I want to give you advice and somebody says, I don't need advice. Allah has already said in this ayah, every one of you needs advice. And then nobody's, free, nobody's doing okay. Everybody needs it. You're all in, you, you and I are all in need of it. But the scary thing here is this disclaimer that I want to tell you. And that disclaimer is that of self-righteousness. So let me just explain what I mean by that really quickly. And we'll conclude today's khutbah. What happens is, I'll, I'll give you a scenario. You have a fight among friends. Right? And now your friends are talking trash about you online. Right? And you're like, oh man, these people, I thought they were my friends, and look at how evil they are. I'm going to seek some counsel from Allah, because Allah has given me advice in the Quran. Oh, I found an ayah. They make their schemes, and Allah makes his scheme in response. And Allah is the best schemer. And you're going to post that meme on your Facebook page, or your in response to your friends that are, that are trashing you, right? Because... Now you, and you're like, to, to yourself, you told yourself, I just sought counsel from the Qur'an because Allah gave me comfort by telling me they plan and Allah plans and Allah is the best planet. That's adorable, but there's something very deeply wrong about that. And let me explain why, if that's not clear to you. In this scenario, what did you do? You assumed that the grand word of Allah in the conflict that you, your petty little Facebook conflict that you have with your friends, the great word of Allah is on team you, right? It's there to, for you to, to get back at them. And Allah, you're not in the service of the word of Allah, but Allah is there Allah is there to make you feel better about the position you're in. You're already without any faults. You're already right. And they're the ones that are wrong. And now you can cite the word of Allah to justify yourself even more. This is not you humbling yourself to the word of your master. This is you humbling the words of your master to you. This is a serious problem. So when people take, when, when you take ayat of the Quran or the counsel Allah has given, and instead of actually taking the counsel, you use them as a weapon. You weaponize the word of Allah against somebody else. You weaponize it against somebody else. This is a mockery of the word of Allah. This is not how counsel is taken. And the ayah that we're reading actually protects us from falling into that trap because Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nasu, because when you call him your rab, you are no longer in a position of using his words the way you want for your purpose that makes you feel better to project yourself onto the word of Allah. But actually you and I come to it with an understanding that we are slaves, faulty slaves, and he has given us counsel from a position of supremacy. From a position, of, so we don't become self-righteous and say this ayah, this is about this is about my friends. Because then think about that ayah. I'm not going to look for a moment. Just contemplate that for a moment. This was about uh, Rasul Sallallahu trying to spread the word of Allah on earth, spreading the Quran. And in the meantime, the Quraysh are realizing that the Prophet's word is spreading quickly. The Quran is spreading quickly. It's becoming a big problem in Mecca, and they're having late night meetings on how to take care of this problem. Should we get him killed? Should we pay somebody to create, you know, new scandals against him? Should we create the allegation that he's a poet or he's stealing this material from somewhere else? How should we undo this spreading of the Quran in Mecca? And they're having late night discussions about this. They're doing good Mecca. And the Prophet on the other side is not having counter meetings on how to undo their propaganda. He's standing in Dajjud. He's standing there reciting Quran. And so on the one hand is the slave of Allah turning to Allah and sharing his word. And on the other are people that have converged to destroy the word of Allah spreading in the world. And Allah looks at that scenario and says, yes, they're doing that. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of that. I'll take care of that for you. That noble scene where the slave of Allah is there to serve Allah's word, and those who conspire against that person, that messenger, Allah will deal with them directly. You're taking that ayah to use it for the beef you got between your friends or your cousins. You see how petty you, <laughs> you turn that something, something so grand, and you turn it into something so petty. And say, no, 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 the Quran applies for everyone, bro. It's not just about the time of the Prophet, so I have to apply it universally. That's not how you apply it. 
there's a, the, the missing ingredient here is the mer rabbikum maybe. Mer rabbikum. You know, the, the, there's a lack of humility and there's a self-righteousness that somehow the Quran is always on your side, which means you can't be wrong, everybody else is wrong. Right? Don't consider yourselves pure. He knows better who has taqwa. He knows better who has taqwa. So yes, we, I, I have to encourage myself, I have to encourage all of you to seek counsel from Allah's word. But don't misunderstand. But with that counsel, there's a way to take it. There's a way to take that. And we're going to unpack that as we as we make our journey towards finding real happiness in this life. And Allah Azza wa grant us real farah in this life and in the next. And Allah Azza wa open up the, the guidance and the light and the wisdom of the Quran to all of our hearts and the hearts of our families. Barakallahu alayhi wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.